So, hello everybody, welcome to this uh, new Robustly Beneficial podcast. Uh, it's going to be uh, a bit unusual today uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, it's, uh, we're doing this uh, uh, via Zoom uh, because, well, like many people, we are confined. And uh, the second thing is that uh, we're going to discuss not a paper, but a series of videos by um, a YouTuber called uh, Smarter Every Day. His name is uh, Dustin Sandin. It's a very, very big channel, like uh, uh, one of the main uh, science YouTube channels uh, these days. It has like 5 million uh, subscribers, something like this. And he's usually tack he usually tackles like very engineering, more kind of uh, problems, uh, science and engineering uh, problems. Like uh, he's a mechanical engineer. And it's very unusual for him to, to be tackling the, the problem that we're going to discuss today, which is the problem of... Uh, of uh, false information and, uh, and fake accounts and uh, how in particular social media uh, companies are trying to deal with this. Uh, and it's uh, very interesting because he actually gets to interview people from the different companies. Uh, unfortunately, he did not get to interview people from, from YouTube, but he did get to interview, well, he, he interviewed people from YouTube, but he could not uh, uh, film it. And so it's not broadcast on, the, on his channel. Uh, but there are interviews of different people, people from Facebook, people from Twitter, and also like people outside of, of these companies who have an external uh, viewpoint on what these companies are doing. And uh, it's, it's extremely, uh, like uh, these videos I think are extremely important because uh, I, I still believe that uh, social medias are underrated or, or neglected, especially by the uh, AI safety community. Uh, and yet they have a huge, huge, huge uh, in impact as discussed in this video. Of course, there's this example of Cambridge Analytica um, in 2016, uh, 15, 16. Uh, but uh, since then, there's still a lot, a lot of things going on. It, what it really shows is that it's a really big challenge for this company to deal uh, with this. So yeah, I, th I think the videos are really interesting. They are a bit long, but they are very complete. So I, I highly uh, encourage uh, <laughs> viewers uh, to, to go and check it out, check them out. Uh, and maybe now we can discuss a little bit more uh, the contents of the videos. Uh, oui. So the first video is about uh, checking the truth of uh, information online. And it starts with the realization that uh, a lot of the content that we find on social medias is uh, very often a distortion of the truth. Uh, the first question to ask is uh, why would there be a fake information online and uh, for the case of social media the answer that's that it gives is that there can be two reasons one is to uh, get ad revenue by uh, simulating engagement mm. so most often the fake news is something that's very attractive and make us uh, want to click on and uh, and, and, and look at yeah, there, there's, uh, a, there's, there's a paper that showed that uh, uh, in, in science, I think that showed that like essentially fake news uh, contents were like uh, ten to a hundred times more viral than uh, the uh, more factual counterparts. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the way I see this is that uh, often uh, if you limit yourself to the truth, it's uh, it's quite harder to uh, to create content that is uh, viral and uh, very engaging. Well, if you don't give yourself any limits and you can uh, go to the realm of uh, any uh, invented news, then it's much easier. Uh, the second reason is to manipulate opinion. And uh, this is a, a more worrisome, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, it's interesting to note that, um, uh, so uh, Justin, um, uh, Sandlin, uh, Sandlin uh, as, as, many, as many people on, uh, of us, uh, many of us on, uh, were a bit active on the internet. Yeah. on social media past two years noticed or three years there was a surge of strange videos who are repetitive who say the same thing but then they change the title or they change the they, they have like automated background and uh, in the same period i was noting the same thing in, uh, in in different languages so for instance in french english and uh, and uh, arabic and moroccan and in different regions of, uh, of which I could understand the language, there was a surge of this phenomenon of people. Uh, and it seems that uh, most of the time it was just for uh, maximize, like just generating clicks and, and, and ads. Uh, but later it turns out that uh, behind, so there was, there was the first motivation 
people who just realized that you can game the, the algorithms generate a lot of redundant automated uh, automatedly talking uh, oh, yeah aut automated uh, you know with text to speech videos uh, where where it's free to produce because you just create a text and then you have a, a, an algorithm that reads the text in different intonations and with different uh, changes of of, of 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 words that the algorithm doesn't detect as redundant uh, but very quickly people realized that besides the let's game the algorithm and have a lot of ad, ad revenue, there was malicious, uh, malicious intentions, uh, intention that appears just from the topics. Uh, and the topics were not very innocent. So for, for instance, the ones he noticed were on politics, on the Clinton versus Trump uh, campaigns. I noted the same for, for many politically relevant topics in, in the different regions of the world I, I, I noticed. And, and people were not taking that very seriously. They, it was it was very it, it went un, unnoticed um, for a while. Uh, there was the Cambridge Analytica who made people realize the, the, the extent of, of related uh, uh, misbehaviors on social media. But but this phenomenon of automated like massively produced videos mm. uh, who are exactly the same, but they are produced in a way such that they are not detected as the same. So, so for example, you produce a hundred videos saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. You change the text, you change the photo, so the algorithm doesn't detect it as redundant. And most of them will make five views or three views or zero views, but one of them will search and, and exceeds the, some threshold of 100,000 or 50,000 or 20,000, depending on the country. And once this threshold is reached, with bots and non-legitimate non clicks, it seems that humans start watching it. And th this is where the problem starts. And, and, and those videos then are shared on WhatsApp and create uh, the problem, like fuel the infobesity problem. Infobesity is a mix of information and obesity. So, and, and, like, and, and then you have a problem of people m m misinformed and engaging to the worst informative content there is. And um, in context like the actual one, uh, it's not something we, we want and it's something we need to prevent. So we need to talk about how to prevent this in a general context. And uh, maybe if we did this better three years ago, um, today many countries who are facing fake news propagation in, in the context of the the unfortunate uh, coronavirus disease uh, would have been better equipped and uh, it seems that we are not equipped today. Yeah, I think um, one thing important uh, that you pointed out is that it, th there's the problem of, uh, of uh, fake news or false information, but it's not the only problem. Like, uh, and, and I would even argue it's not the main problem, like especially regarding the coronavirus. Um, you also want quality information, you also want uh, important information. To be promoted. Right? To be promoted. And it is not. And, and uh, yeah, and the, the problem is that uh, if you have a lot of uh, content uh, generated by, by different people who just want to make views and uh, for whom the quality and the important information is secondary, uh, then you can uh, flood the internet with information that are not important, that are not uh, critical and people can uh, neglect important problems. And this has become a, a huge challenge in the case of the, the coronavirus. Maybe it's a bit different from what the videos were about, but in the context of coronavirus, for instance, um, like just a few days ago, uh, well, actually two days ago, uh, so uh, Tuesday uh, 17, for those who want to, to follow, because like, the, the timeline is very critical for, for the coronavirus. Uh, the homepage of YouTube has no, yeah, zero video on the coronavirus. Uh, still, uh, still, I checked this morning, uh, so we are March the 19th. I can still have, depending on where I log from, like I can log from uh, a known navigator and have zero coronavirus. So I have uh, the NBA, something on cheese and something on whatever Indian movie and something on, uh, yeah, nothing on coronavirus. Yeah. I so, still so like now, like, this morning, Thursday, Thursday, 19 March. And so you can imagine that the fact that YouTube is not recommending anything about the coronavirus to many people makes people believe that it's not a big deal. And it is a big deal that they don't think that it is a but, big deal because the whole... Just, yeah. In the defense of YouTube, I think yeah. now there is so much misinformation around it 
it might even be safe to not recommend anything on coronavirus. Yeah, so, so it, the job it, is not is not easy either. The, the job is clearly not easy, uh, but arguably there has not been enough uh, preparation for this kind of thing, and just mm -hmm. in general for just promoting quality content and and uh, and there are a few simple ideas that could have been uh, very uh, useful, like for instance. Uh, uh, recommend videos from WHO, from the World Health Organization, or for the, from the CDC. The CDC, uh, Center the, US for has, the Center for Disease Control, has a couple of very, very good mm -hmm. videos, uh, like two-minute videos, very clear. Wow. And they have like 500,000 uh, views, at least uh, maybe yesterday. Um, which you can say, well, that, that's quite a lot, 500,000 views, like it's more than, than I make. But uh, given the scale of the problem, it, it's like essentially nothing compared to the scale of the US. If you think of the percentage of the US population that got exposed to this, uh, even though like 2 billion users are all on uh, YouTube, like 2 billion users, and this only has 500,000 views, like this is uh, less than, well, this is point, uh, 0.05 percent is that it? something like this. So this is very very small, uh, 0.02 percent something like this. Um, and, and yet I think these videos should well these videos arguably should have made uh, hundreds of like well, tens of millions of views uh, at the minimum let's say, but maybe even hundreds of millions of views. Uh, but of course it's not an easy uh, problem. And I think these uh, these videos really show just how hard of a problem it is. Um, like it's easy to blame these companies and uh, that's uh, what I'm doing a lot. Uh, but I think the blame is uh, on everybody, I guess. Uh, like th these problems are also like important challenges for, for academia. Mm. Uh, and arguably academia has not been thinking about this uh, nowhere near enough. There's a problem of respectability of uh, how serious it looks on a resume of a researcher to work yeah. on on the YouTube algorithm or on the Facebook. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are many researchers working on social media. Like, um, yeah, of course, like the things changed, yeah. but still uh, in the corridors, you still hear people saying this is not strong science. Yeah. To study social media. It's, it doesn't, it, it still does not look as respectable as studying fundamental mathematical problems in, 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 in machine learning. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's like in every field, uh, the, the most uh, valued uh, area of the field is like the th very theoretical part of, for instance, in physics, like theoretical physics is the most uh, valued. Uh, uh, and or, or uh, computer it, science is the same. Not, like, it's, not as, it's not as respect, it's not, it does, doesn't look, it's still, you still, of course, I think, of course, there's lots of caveats. Many universities have changed that, this policy and now hiring a lot of uh, researcher working on social media, but you still have this uh, feeling among researchers who can tell you that, uh, yeah, they feel that someone who's working on, uh, on social media is not as serious as someone who is still doing empirical work on image recognition or, uh, oh, yeah. okay. or natural language processing in a fundamental way. Uh, so yeah. yeah, studying social media needs, needs to be more respected and more valued in academia. Mm. Yeah, and the video from Smarter Evidence is actually a, a good example of why uh, social media needs more people to work on and to study. Wow. Uh, one thing that was quite shocking is the scale at which uh, yeah. the social media manipulation happened. And for both the case of, uh, so you mentioned the case of uh, YouTube where fake videos are created and, uh, and, uh, and manipulated so that the recommender catches at least one of them to recommend it to hundreds of thousands of people. But in the case of uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, they both report approximately uh, closing 1 million accounts every single day, 1 million fake accounts that are created. Um, yeah, this is huge. Like, this for is, the sake uh, of manipulating. And this is, 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 is it about 1%, uh, 10% of all the accounts that are, or, or, or maybe even more accounts that are created by human per day? Yeah, uh, I don't know, but uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, I think Twitter is about like uh, uh, two or three hundred million users, maybe something like this. Um, okay, so one per, one million per day would be that uh, one percent of Twitter coming up from uh, from robots signing up every day and uh, yeah. being uh, being reboot. Yeah, yeah, this is huge. <laughs> this is crazy. And so, it, uh, from the video, it sounds that the platform are doing a. Uh, quite a, a, a good amount of work 
to fight yeah. uh, these manipulations. But from uh, from what we see happening in practice, it looks uh, it still looks bad because the manipulation is happening. And uh, as Leo was saying, it's uh, it's easy to to blame the platforms after this, especially because they they also sometimes get money out of uh, these kind of manipulations. If uh, if YouTube promotes uh, conspiracy videos and put ads in in front, they get money out of uh, out of uh, conspiracy videos. So it's very easy to to blame the platforms for this, but on the other hand, uh, as we have been discussing, it's a huge challenge to uh, to counteract this all this manipulation, given the scale of it, given that they are very uh, smart manipulators. The what if 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 there there is a rule to try to to counteract them, they they explain that there is this process of. Uh, uh, the manipulation happen in one way, the platform updates to uh, counteract this way of manipulation, then the manipulator updates to uh, to still be able to uh, to manipulate the social media even given the new uh, the new rules and uh, and then there is an engagement uh, a sort of war between the engineer of Twitter and the engineer of the of man yeah. manipulation company yeah and uh, just to stress how how, how difficult the problem is. Uh, like there, on Twitter, there are lots of, of bots that are legitimate bots, like uh, things that automatically retweet uh, things. Of, of, for instance, uh, YouTube science. Uh, YouTube science. Yeah, the, the 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 French science YouTube community has a uh, like science popularization community has this bot, uh, Café des Sciences, that retweets automatically contents produced by the members of the of the community. You have these excellent bots uh, in mathematics that uh, tweet uh, automatically. Papers, uh, maybe let, let me play the the, the 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 I'm always older in the internet game, but uh, so be before YouTubers, bloggers had this. So it started with blog aggregators in the 2008, 2009. So this trend started with with Twitch, bo with Twitch bots, who were aggregators of blogs. So yeah. whenever a blog post is posted, the the blog aggregator. So you'd have the blog aggregator of France, the blog aggregator of Morocco, the blog aggregator of Switzerland, etc. And then you'd have the blog aggregator of football blogs. And the, it started with blog aggregators. And then many, many, many concepts followed. YouTube channels, uh, news agencies, like you have Associated yeah. Press, Associated Press, uh, Reuters, etc. Whenever uh, news, uh, whenever something is released on their website, there's an automated tweet. Now there's like humans tweeting it, etc. But like many, many tweets are, are legitimately automated. And you, if you just automatically rule out automated tweets, yeah, you, end up, you end up deleting a significant portion of the useful Twitter, which is legitimate and not malicious. Yeah. So that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is that the, 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 the bad actors are... Uh, well, I still, still need to define what bad means, but yeah, I'd say the bad actors are getting more and more sophisticated. And uh, and recently, they are probably using uh, natural language processing algorithms to 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 actually tweet things that sound a lot like what humans would tweet. And uh, it sounds uh, hard to speak like a human, but speaking like a human on Twitter is not that hard. Right? If you think of some tweets accounts, Twitter accounts, I'm not naming uh, any Twitter accounts in particular, but sometimes it's not very sophisticated. What uh, what's tweeted by these accounts. And also you see, so just um, on this like sophisticated uh, malicious bots. Uh, so for example, for the political uh, political bots, which I was following for quite a while uh, when I was working on uh, on this project called Memphis Kinch, um, you see them gaming now. So Twitter implemented a lot of filters to, to rule out bots, illegitimate bots. And one of the filters was to look at biographies. Because those bots had very low sophisticated, not very sophisticated biographies or, or redundant biographies. And now you see them gaming the biography, like they have bios. And, yeah. uh, and uh, like, the, for example, one, for one time, one time, Twitter was like, like, Twitter accounts with no profile pictures were flagged first. So they started having profile pictures. Yeah. And then, okay, they started having, uh, from having them from banks of images, so publicly available images. So Twitter started filtering that. They started having their own images. We now know that you can generate uh, images that are hard to detect as, as non-humans. So um, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. And uh, uh, it's not easy to be on the... Um, on the 
cats or mouse, whatever, whatever is your preferred animal science. Yeah. So not easy to be on the on the Twitter uh, safety team. So, by the way, just coming back to the topic, the videos. Uh, I think yeah, one of the most interesting ones was the one where um, oh, Justin Sandler's uh, interview Sandlin, sorry, interviewed the Twitter safety team, and uh, they were. I think the, the thing with Twitter is that they are in general transparent on on how they deal with that. So the the drawback is that they got criticized a bit more compared to their size. They only have yeah. two million users. Uh, but yeah, it's not easy to be on the safety uh, on the safety team's part. I think for for none of the three platforms or. Like you, you sometimes develop some empathy for the for the Twitter engineers uh, who have to deal with all of this. Um, it, it's definitely uh, like very very hard. Like one difficult point is that. Uh, it is very hard to say what's a legitimate account and what's a, a, a fake account. I don't know if the word fake is the right one. They're just saying a bad account. Uh, because in, in the end, it's really about like uh, discussing what we really want for Twitter to be like. And uh, this also depends on the impact that Twitter is having on the world. Uh, you can imagine that um, some Twitter that we all like is actually very bad because it had side effects that we cannot uh, easily spot. Uh, then maybe if we thought longer, we would change our mind. Um, yeah, so, so just the definition of what uh, should be done, what uh, should be moderated, what accounts should be removed on Twitter is uh, a huge eth ethical dilemma. And we don't have the tools uh, to, to define what's a legitimate account. We don't have a proper definition for this. We don't know what, how to do uh, about this. And this is why uh, AI ethics is very critical and ideas like uh, the one you discussed uh, last week about uh, we build AI and, and, and things like this. Uh, they, they're not ready, they're nowhere near ready, uh, I'd say uh, at this point, but uh, as time goes, like we, we really need to be thinking about how to define uh, what what we mean uh, and to define in an algorithmic sense not in a blurry uh, vague wow. sense what we mean by what we uh, a legitimate account is what, what are the accounts that should be uh, removed from, from Twitter mm -hmm. this is a big challenge <laughs> yeah and it seems to me that it's a, a bit of a losing game uh, because as technology increases we we see in the previous years that it's much and much more easy that uh, to imitate a human uh, to perfection so yeah. I, I guess when uh, when the algorithm reached the human level of imitating humans, uh, it, it won't be able to, to remove it. So there was uh, interesting ideas on the on the interview with the fa Facebook uh, team, which was that uh, instead of uh, uh, removing some type of account, mm -hmm. uh, because this 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 create uh, consequences that are that are also undesirable, but uh, simply. Uh, recommending them less and less with a, an exponentially decreasing rate. Mm -hmm. So here, here the solution could be that, uh, as they're saying, if we, if we know that some type of content is, uh, is beneficial and some, e, and some are not, the, the solution would simply be to uh, recommend uh, more the beneficial content, which is also something that depends on, uh, on the individual. So for some people, uh, we would want to recommend different uh, type of content. It's because uh, so I believe that in the uh, in, uh, in the future it would be impossible to to cut out fake accounts. So I, I see the only solution is to uh, to detect uh, what are good content and whether the good content comes from a true accounts or fake account mm -hmm. it doesn't matter much. I'm recommending the the good content. Yeah, I feel that uh, we are already uh, on the. <laughs> On the bridge, uh, like we are essentially more, or like we are more or less, uh, the, well, the, the Twitter, uh, the Turing, the Twitter Turing test, test, test yeah, the Twitter Turing test <laughs> uh, is almost passed, uh, is essentially passed, like for, for bad uh, Twitter accounts. Uh, let accounts. me let me give you a thought experiment to see, like, yeah. why we don't even need to go there, mm -hmm. why we don't even need to go to the situation where we have bots uh, imitating <laughs> humans, indistinguishable for humans, etc. So let's come back to these aggregators. You remember like the blog aggregators, the YouTube channels aggregators. So let's, it's, it was, it's, so for now the consensus is that a bot that just tweets automatically uh, news from some legitimate website is, is a legit um, automated bot. So this is a, not the kind of bot you would rule out. But imagine 
So I want to promote, so imagine there's a camp A and camp B. They're like two sides of a story. There's side A and side B. And I want to promote side A in uh, and then non, so just flood side B uh, in the noise of side A. So side B released the press release and side A released the press release. But then side A have a hundred or a thousand more bots re retweeting or tweeting the the communicate like the the press release of site a yeah. and of course with some tweaks in the wording etc would this be considered as a legitimate bot tweeting the press release as as the agreements the current consensus is is that you are if you are just a bot that tweets a press release yeah. from a so, news agency so or for example, Democrats and Republicans both have an official, like the, the Democratic National Convention and the, the, the I don't know, the Republican Party, etc. And uh, what if I just create bots that are just legitimately releasing the press release? There's nothing malicious, nothing fake. There's yeah. no, no, no lie. I'm not yeah. lying. I'm just, I'm just offloading with, with side A. Yeah, so here the problem I, I see is that if you just have a simple rule to... Uh to decide what is a uh, accepted behavior and uh, an unstrict behavior, yeah. then the simple rule can easily be game, just like you described. Uh, that you would create 1,000 accounts that follow the simple rule, mm -hmm. but are all slightly different because there's also a rule that says uh, very similar accounts are, are forbidden. And, uh, and yeah. that's the problem that these teams have. They, oh, spoil, they write an algorithm that, oh. uh, an algorithm that blocks uh, unauthorized uh, uh, participation on the platform. Uh -huh. And then there are smart people uh, that uh, that do their best to continue uh, uh, advancing their agenda, manipulating the way they want, for, by following by still following the rules because the the rule of the platform is uh, is what gets promoted there. Well, so spoil the the, the the okay. Spoil the the basic version of what I described is already solved by Twitter. They have a lot of anti redundancy redundancy mm -hmm. policies. Even yourself, you can't tweet the same thing twice in a short span of time, etc. But you can think of many variants of this that will not be detected by their system. So, so I guess we, we, we more or less, agree, I think we agree. Uh, I think we gave several arguments for saying that um, direct moderation of accounts is very complicated. I think um, overall, like just the idea of censorship is, uh, is complicated because people, but also like it, it relates to freedom of speech and, and stuff like this. Uh, what the interesting example that was given by uh, Facebook in the, the, the interview of a Facebook employee is that it, uh, when it came to um, sexual contents and uh, especially like uh, what uh, people were wearing on pictures, uh, what uh, female bodies were, were wearing, uh, on, uh, female people <laughs> were wearing on, on, on uh, pictures, uh, ex essentially uh, there was uh, some line that you wanted to draw, but this line may be different from different people. And also what they observe is that if you draw a line, then the, the contents that are closer to this line are, are just much more viral. People tend to like things that are very close to, to, to the line. Uh, and this is something about human psychology. It's not, it has nothing to do with uh, algorithms. Uh, so the fact that we are more drawn by, by this kind of contents. Uh, and the, uh, the trick of, uh, of Facebook uh, to, to sort of discourage people from, from searching for this line and like uh, uh, playing with the line is uh, to instead of having this threshold, having some, uh, some like you just recommend uh, less and less as people, as uh, content gets more and more uh, sexual. Because uh, and given this, there's no more line. Like people are just. Uh, I think this is a, this smoother transition is it just um, like it feels much better. Like uh, it feels like uh, something that's much more robust uh, to, to to gaming the rules, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also much more important if you think about this, because we talk a lot about moderation and censorship, uh, and I think this is more sexy, and that's why uh, we talk so much about this. But the, the real thing that just really changes everything about the platform is recommendation, especially on, on YouTube where 70% of the, of the views are recommendations by the algorithm. Uh, the, the recommendation algorithm is, is absolutely critical. And we can play a lot more with this and with uh, smooth uh, constraints rather than, than harsh constraints. And I think this is something that's interesting. Yeah, hey, just um, just to, to clarify, whenever so when I say um, filter out, filter in, I'm not uh, talking about the 
classical binary concept of filtering, which is like filtering out would be removing and filtering in would be showing. So here it means uh, recommending and de-recommending. So it's not, it's not zero one, it's like pushing it close to zero or pushing it close to probability one of being seen. And yeah. by the way, it's just talking about law and, uh, and uh, rights. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, it, this is something still not very clear in the current laws on freedom of speech, etc. How to deal with the being de-recommended or uh, having the other side being over-recommended. So, for example, in the context of elections, uh, you can have clear statements on that from the legal point of view that the, each party should have access to the same uh, side, like the same audience. For example, even when you take Europe, many countries have uh, uh, the um, audience time uh, metrics, and each party should be it's like you have to prove that uh, you have given every side the same uh, same amount of people watching there uh, or same time or same. Um, but in the general context of freedom of speech, uh, if Facebook starts uh, de-recommending my content, so it's not deleted, it's, it's just there, but nobody sh watched it. Uh, it's not clear to me, like in many countries, you still cannot define this as being banned. Yeah. A band is still a binary definition. Band when, means when you're... And many, by the way, I, I, many people who are active on the internet censorship thing, like many, many, of, them, many of them still talk in terms of being banned. Yeah. Being banned is is like negligible. Yeah, it's negligible. negligible of the problem. The yeah, problem so being de-recommended and having another side being over-recommended. Yeah, so Tristan Harris, uh, who's having this excellent podcast called uh, "Your Undivided Attention," he uh, and also with his co-host. Uh, I don't remember his name, sorry. Uh, they uh, have this notion of freedom of reach as opposed to freedom of speech. Uh, but just the word freedom, I think, is uh, maybe a bit misleading. Uh, like, at, at some point, you, you, like, if everybody wants to say something about coronavirus, should you give equal amount of speech to everybody? I, like, I don't think, think so. Clearly, uh, like, clearly I, I don't think people think so as well. No, I think clearly now, like, there is... I would bet there is a growing consensus that we should listen to the experts, so yeah. the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, etc. On YouTube now you have an automated thing, which is a good thing. Like whenever there is a video that is detected to be related to coronavirus, under it you would have a banner. Yeah. By the way, here is what the World Health Organization says. It's yeah, good. It's good. Um, I'm not sure many people who are watching YouTube, like I watch YouTube on my laptop. I don't think I'm a representative of the, of the actual YouTube user. Uh, I don't think people who watch YouTube on their smartphones uh, re notice the banner or click on it. Uh, you have to be like on a laptop; it's it's big enough. You see it, etc. And um, uh, I would challenge its efficiency. So for for, for now, uh, it's clear, like I, I think a good thing YouTube could start doing. Uh, we we all agreed. I think we spent the episode saying that the task is not easy technically. So it's yeah. not very easy to detect what is a good coronavirus video. Like, no, yeah, it's very no, hard. Very, Not even well. the World Health Organization cannot come with the definition of what is a good or what are the criteria to be a good coronavirus video. Yeah. But uh, especially, by the way, especially like now, now there are like concerns yeah, like videos made by medical doctors. So, yeah. for example, recently there is like a debate about uh, chloroquine. There's this molecule oh, yeah, yeah. with uh, malaria and there's... It's not clear whether it's safe or not, but then there was a professor of med medicine... Uh, in southern France, promoting somehow not not really promoting it, but talking on it while it's still very preliminary. And for example, in Morocco, you have now pharmacies running out of medicine that is needed for other patients, just because it contains chloroquine. Yep. So because there is this video on chloroquine in French, which many many Moroccan people who went to school understand. So people went to pharmacies and started buying medicine for like containing chloroquine, yeah. so paludism medicine. And you have real patients needing it for real diseases where we know that the molecule is really efficient, running out of it just because people who heard maybe chloroquine would be good because this professor of medicine said it. So, so even it's like, for example, the criteria, if, like one, one easy criteria is to tell YouTube, okay, whenever you feel that there is like, you detect that there is an authority, a scientific authority, promote the video. Even that would be dangerous. 
Because yeah. even if like, if you have a professor of medicine saying, I'm working on chloroquine and it shows that it may be efficient against coronavirus, then you have people going to pharmacies and, and, and yeah. planning buying chloroquine. So yeah. it, it's not easy. It's not easy. And yeah. you can't solve it by just telling YouTube if you detect the, the person or the channel. So the channel is official. The channel is of the Institute of... Uh, it's a medical institute in southern France, a public institute, a, like university style, or like research research medical institute, uh, the YouTube channel. And um, so if you, if you tell YouTube, whenever you detect uh, an institute that has yeah. scientific authority promoted, even that is dangerous. Yeah. So maybe we can settle on a very small subset, um, which are the institutes who deal with the pandemic, which are the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control. Yeah. Also, I see a problem in another in another area. The, the, the problem for me is that uh, so first of all, you should not recommend the same video to everyone. This uh, video from uh, this famous doctor of, of France mm. maybe should not be shown. It doesn't it doesn't do any good to show it to uh, exactly. to the whole population, but maybe to show it to other people studying researchers. similar ideas. Yeah, to researchers. Yeah, and also it's not only about the the quality of the content like the how true and uh, how true what he said is in that case if we want something really true we would ask experts because they are the the one closer to, to what's true but it's about uh, how the content is uh, understood by uh, by the viewers and the effect it has on on, on them and here uh, i i guess it's uh, if you only listen to experts you most people would not completely understand they would uh, Mm. maybe think think they understand it but uh, behave in a way that is a uh, that is not appropriate compared to what they, they yes. do. So. yeah so i have this feeling about the coronavirus situation like uh, yeah a lot of the content is not uh, user friendly <laughs> yes. and and you absolutely need that this to be understood by many people yeah. uh, that's why i think like, typically here the science communicators had have oh. had a, a key role to play <laughs> But it's very hard, like for YouTube to to choose which video to recommend. Uh, like I, I've been actually thinking a lot about this, and for a long time in, in the US, uh, in the English-speaking world, uh, like I, I was puzzled. Like I did not what know what video should be appointed. Like I had this, this thought experiment, and it, like the CDC videos were, were amazing. Like I think this one should really be. Mm -hmm. But it comes from the CDC that most people have never heard of. Uh, of. And if you can imagine that a YouTuber with 5 million subscribers make a, like Dustin Sander, for instance, makes a, Sandlin, uh, makes a, uh, uh, okay. uh, makes a video like, like, like this, uh, then it's going to be much more impactful to an audience that would not be as easily convinced by uh, CDC videos and that also would be less willing to click on these videos. So it, it's a very, very uh, complicated question. You also have things like, like you talked about this, um, Example, which is very nice because it's about side effects. Like, uh, mm. like this thing has side effects in other countries because they, they, they thought it was good. So they and it has side effects on people who actually needed. Uh, but by the way, just to clarify, in case the professor is watching us, his videos have nothing harmful if watched by researchers. It's just it doesn't contain the need, the necessary caveats that are needed for for a general audience. Yeah. Like I've heard this other thing about uh, using uh, masks uh, for the coronavirus, uh, which like in, in some countries, like you wanted to encourage people to, to use the mask because, pe because people already had uh, these masks uh, at home. But in other countries, and especially in European or, or American countries, uh, these masks, are, are on, uh, there are not that many of such masks and you actually need them to be used by doctors. And so if you tell people that these are useful to prevent uh, the, the spread of the uh, epidemic, um, then people are going to buy for themselves and, uh, and it's actually bad overall. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very, very hard to know what should be recommended, especially at the time of crisis, like, uh, right. like the coronavirus situation. Uh, and that's why I think we need to prepare for this and preparing for this, like I think we could have uh, much better contained uh, the, the situation if the YouTube algorithm were aligned <laughs> like if we had worked prior to this on how to better promote this or that videos but it's very very hard and we need to start now for the next uh, I think, pandemic yeah, just, uh, just coming back to the general topic of our channel and our, our project uh being like robustly this the beneficial like not here not not uh, not uh, automated like not not recommender systems but just decision making uh, i think it's a big time also to think about decision making in the context of humans yeah 
uh, some things from the past that um, tended to be seen as uh, has been and, and, and bad and old style and old school uh, maybe need to be re-examined and uh, re-evaluated uh, in the context of crisis. For example, the fact that not everything was open and shared with the public. So that's something from the past because we, there was no internet and YouTube. So an expert could not broadcast his expertise or her expertise to the general public. Uh, maybe in the time of a crisis, uh, you should think about the side effects of putting your expertise online. Because maybe if you're talking to your researchers' peers and trying to convince them they should experiment with chloroquine, it's robustly beneficial to broadcast it to your researchers' peers. Mm -hmm. But if you broadcast it to the general public, you'd have yeah. side effects that uh, a, medic a medicine that is needed for another disease, on which we are sure it deals with it, we'd, we'd, we'd be running out of stocks. Yes. So maybe you, just, you have to also consider whether you should be open or not on yeah. something. In, in the time of crisis. So it's not about, it's not only, about, we shouldn't also talk about like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, but also humans. Yeah. I, I, like, should you share a preliminary research finding in a time of crisis? I would bet no. Yeah. I would like share it with, the, with, with your peers. There are like mailing lists, there are academic mailing lists, researchers, mailing lists, whatever. But putting it there on the public, I'm not sure it's a robustly beneficial decision. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, like we want to be. It's it's hard like, because it's the first time we face uh, such a big crisis. Uh, but I think it's important for everyone to, to to reflect on, yeah, what should be shared publicly, what should be kept privately, to whom, to communicate what. Uh, and uh, I think there were there there, were, there have been a few bad decisions, and uh, uh, I, I think I've made uh, quite a lot of bad decisions, but. Uh, we need to, to look at this and improve and, and also ask uh, how to automate, uh, like how to, what, what is the procedure that we should have been following and, and yeah, try to think more algorithmically about uh, what to do in, in case of, of, yeah. of these situations. Like this is a philosophy on the harsh deadline. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A very harsh deadline. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing maybe we can talk about uh, before wrapping up is uh, the fact that um, uh, moderators of, uh, of these companies, uh, human moderators of, of these companies are being asked to work, uh, to not work, to not come to work because of the uh, confinement and they cannot work from home because of, uh, of uh, security constraints in these companies. Uh, and thus, we're going to probably have a lot of a lot more. It's not probably it started happening. Yeah. So, so just like to put this in context, uh, if some of you have seen posts deleted from Facebook, for instance, yeah. on on coronavirus yesterday, or if your own posts have been deleted, which has uh, been the, my case, for instance, very likely. So in like in the case of Lay, very likely, and uh, I the very likely is not only for, for like from me, but. Uh, Alexand Alex Stamos, who was the chief security officer of Facebook before he resigned in 2018. Uh, so Alexander Stamos, who, and who is now a security researcher in Stanford, say like it's probably linked to the fact that uh, YouTube has human content moderators, mm -hmm. and uh, since they are not allowed to work from home, now they are not working, and YouTube is deploying the automated content moderator tools. Which, as, which are not ready to use as, as, as you realized. Yeah. And because of that, now you have a lot of legitimate content removed and maybe non-legitimate content not removed. We don't know. So yeah, now the situation now is buggy, is messy. And partly because people are now not working. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, <laughs> like these, these con uh, content uh, moderation or, con or recommendation tools are, are becoming more important than ever. And they were not ready because, uh, well, because it's a very hard problem, but also probably because we did not work on this enough. So <laughs> let's work on this. <laughs> yeah. Let's, should we wrap up? Yes. Uh, do we? Thank you for watching us today. And uh, next week we will discuss the, another paper called uh, AI Safety via via the debate from uh, Irvine and, uh, and uh, Paul Cristiano. Um, so, good see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you. See you.